Christmas Day on The Kelly Clarkson Show. Coming to you from the White House. I cannot believe I'm saying that. Hi, y'all. <laughs> First Lady, Dr. Jill Biden. You and I have both been through divorce. I can't imagine being married again. If I hadn't gotten divorced, I never would have met Joe. I can't wait until that day comes for you. It's a Kelly exclusive. What is one thing you like to do post-COVID? Maybe go have a martini and some french fries. Yes! <laughs> Watch Thursday on The Kelly Clarkson Show. Welcome to the Believe Podcast Network SoCal Sweat. My name is Ann McDaniels, a former NFL cheerleader and product manager turned actress and model who dreams of being a UFC fighter. Meow. Learning strategies to help motivate others leads me to bring you interviews each week from a range of athletes, experts in fitness and nutrition, and so much more. Thanks for listening to Believe, the number one podcast for working professionals, And let's push our endorphins to higher performance through SoCal Sweat. This is your host, Ann McDaniels. And thank you so much for joining me on another episode of SoCal Sweat. Now, this is such an interesting episode. I can't wait to introduce you to my guest and just the backstory. Now, some of you may have heard of Camp Shane. And this is based on a MTV documentary on, quote unquote, Fat Camp. It took place in the Poconos in upstate New York, and it followed a group of kids going through weight loss camps with their nutrition, their physical activity, the mental pressures, and everything else that would go along with said a fat camp, quote unquote. Today's guest, Alana Molstein, was one of those little kids that attended the fat camp for years and years over the summers. By the time Alana was 13 years old, she weighed over 200 pounds and struggled with losing weight, emotional eating, and diets that didn't work. While most kids dream of becoming pop stars or famous athletes, Alana's early inspirations were the knowledgeable registered dietitians she met every summer at Fat Camp. She became one herself, the first chance she got, and used everything she learned to lose 100 pounds. Since then, She's built a thriving practice in Beverly Hills and helped hundreds of people lose weight, a million pounds and counting, and happily keeping it off. Alana is highly educated as a registered dietitian, nutritionist, educator, mom, and health enthusiast. She sits on the prestigious executive leadership team for the American Heart Association and leads the Bruin Health Improvement Program at UCLA. She's also an Amazon bestseller in her book, you can drop it. In addition, she helps coach in business other registered dietitians and nutritionists to make more money, gain more clients, and help more people. And I can't wait to introduce you also to her TikTok popularity, which is Nutrition Babe. You've got to check out her videos because, yes, she is a bona fide babe. And I'm so excited to introduce Ilana Bulstein, dietitian nutritionist, educator, mom, and overall health enthusiast. Good morning to Ilana Molstein. How are you today and how was your weekend? It was great. Thank you so much for having me. Wonderful. Well, I found Ilana um, through the Sean T podcast and I was just fascinated by her story. She had grown up on the East Coast, gone to several summers of fat camps, as we say, and I knew that's certainly not a politically correct uh, way to say that. But, she but has, that's how people know it. Yeah. Okay, exactly. And she has parlayed herself into a highly successful nutritional and RD and just overall diet coach and helping so many people. So Ilana, please, um, could you please describe your upbringing, your childhood, and your going to the camps every summer? Yeah, of course. So I was morbidly, morbidly obese as a kid. Uh, and starting at four years old, I just was so much more aware that I was double to triple the size of my friends. And doctor visits were definitely a struggle, uh, as so many people can relate to now. And I am so grateful to this day for the pediatrician I had at that time, uh, Dr. Rose Varon. And she is amazing. She was at Tenafly Pediatrics in Jersey. And to this day, I think about her as just truly saving my life because my parents were getting divorced. Everything was in disarray. The thoughts in their minds was like just all over the board. I was one of three kids. There were so much more other things to think about, like where we were gonna live or what schools we'd continue to go to that 
my weight or what dinner would be for the night was just like the absolute back burner uh, in their lives. And so I just kept blooming uh, in my weight over overeating, uh, emotional eating, would sit alone in the kitchen, watching television as a six-year-old finishing jars of peanut butter on my own. And my pediatrician at eight years old was like, what? like you have to go to weight loss camp this summer, you have to go to fat camp and handed me a brochure and I just remember hysterical crying and my mom patting my back and saying she was going to make it good and she's going to make it fun, but it was terrifying. And I'd say it's probably to my benefit that at eight years old, you really don't know so much better. Um, I, it was the first year people even go to sleepaway camp, right? So a lot of my friends weren't even going to sleepaway camps yet. So they weren't going to, you know, regular ones. And I was going to the fat camp where that happened few years later. At this point, it's like all my friends were doing, I don't know, some sort of day camp. And I was going And again, like we didn't have cell phones or the social pressure you get later on in uh, early adolescence, you know, you, this is eight years old. So kind of before you're, you're so aware of what's happening. And it's almost like I blinked my eye, my mom packed me and I was in G1, like girls bunk one of Camp Shane, the most famous, uh, well-known weight loss camp, the one that was featured on MTV uh, and probably the one modeled uh, by Heavyweights, the movie and so forth. And I ended up uh, being in G1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, like 16. I ended up just going to the camp for so many years because that first summer I did lose a significant amount of weight. I lost like 35 pounds. They took my before and after picture that was actually in the brochure for many years following it. But then I went back to school and I lost the 30 pounds that I lost in two months. I probably gained back in the next three and a half, four months. And uh, so when I started weight loss camp again in June, I was up maybe 50 pounds from where I was the prior June. Uh, but for my parents, it was like, again, they were in disarray. They were dating. They were worried about my other two siblings in life and, you know, moving on with theirs that the easy solution was, okay, just send her back to weight loss camp, right? Not change all of our ways and try to find a system together. It was like, let's send her back to weight loss camp. And, you know, all the power of respect to my parents, because they also struggled tremendously with their food. So it's not like they had this like incredible solution or support to give me. They were doing the same thing in their own ways, like going, jumping from diet to diet and so forth. It wasn't like they had the best, you know, modeling to show me and so forth. So I went back to camp and, um, it just be, kind of became my thing. And because I was such an OG, I was there so early. Like I just, I did become, you know, popular or just had a lot of good friends and it just kind of actually became an oasis for me. And I actually, while the camp concept is twisted in that it helps you lose weight, but doesn't really give you the sustainability tactics to keep it off. Cause that would actually be bad for business. If you think about it, <laughs> you wouldn't come back the following year. Um, but the truth is I really look at the camp in such a positive light because it really kickstarted me with a highly positive relationship with weight loss. And I saw weight loss as color war. I saw weight loss as talent shows. I saw weight loss as you know, a place where I had boyfriends and was able to share clothes with friends where, you know, I didn't have that at my own home base. I saw going on the scale as a thing you do lined up with 20 of your friends, all high-fiving each other because, uh, you know, that was our Tuesday morning activity. So, so it was I mean, in a positive light. And I, cause I'm so curious as to how the weigh-ins were done and all the physical activity, were you up at like six in the morning running sort of military style? How did that happen? Yeah. Oh my God, this is such a fun interview. I'm so happy to like do a deep dive into fat camp. Yeah. Um, so the truth is, is I am inherently, I think, wired really well in that I've had an obscene amount of challenges in my life, like unruly. And by the way, that parent divorce was only one of what ended up being five divorces so far um, in my family. Wow. And 
of my parents. And so there's been, there were so many moves and there was so much drama and there was just, it's, it's actually, I wish it was ending, but uh, my, my family continues to be, you know, somewhat whimsical as I'm sure <laughs> a lot of people's are. Um, but, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, but, um, you know, some people chose to look at it as the worst thing ever. And I'll say the worst thing people did was choose it as a way of how much can I cheat the system? Right. A lot of people would get their best friends to sew, you know, M&Ms into their teddy bears. And even though everything got checked, right, all of our packages were checked. You never got a package like a letter. You got a slip, a package slip. And then after dinner, when package hours were open, you waited in line so you could have 10 counselors open up the package in front of the rest prison. of the line. It's prison. And, huh. <laughs> what? It's like prison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same thing. And then, yeah, the whole thing, everything you saw is is true. Um, and uh, yeah, so some people like really, I mean, I had friends who would suck on Advil tablets because they're sugar coated. Um, vodka and water bottles. I mean, you know, as you get older, you see there's like definitely drugs and things like that but that would you know that's not something you're exposed to young but that's probably in every single camp like that was only when I was much 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 older I saw that that's not something like the camp endorses in any way I want to be very right clear on right that. absolutely um but uh yeah I mean it was the only thing I think I ever like quote unquote cheated or snuck was gum they really didn't like gum um one because you know some it's loaded with artificial sweeteners and things like that uh, but also just because it made the camp messy, you know, you have gum like stuck everywhere and things like that. But that was something I, I've always liked. So I, I really took it to be like the opposite of those people. I didn't come in kicking and screaming. I actually, I looked at it as something I needed and became super grateful for because I was at a point where I was gaining 50, 60 pounds in 10 months, September to June. So at that rate of rapid weight gain, I started to look at the two months I spent at summer camp or nine weeks, how the camp was structured. I looked at it as like, take as much freaking advantage as you possibly can, Alana. Like get ahead so that, you know, it doesn't all spiral back on as fast or as much in the coming school year. Unfortunately, those intentions, you know, didn't really play out because I just kept gaining the weight back year after year. I ended up going for like eight years and it wasn't until my uh, last, my last like one or two or la yeah, last two that I really was like enough is enough. And I actually brought in a tool that would help me make it that way. So I basically went from eight, nine, 10, 11, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Yeah, I went for six straight years. And it was at my, that year of, that I was 13 going into high school that I really had that enough, enough, enough is enough mentality going into high school, but I brought in the scale and the scale is to this day, I talk about the scale and the highest regard. I think it's like the best tool in the world. I have done loads of research on it that I've published in my book and the journal of obesity and so forth. But the, the scale is really what saved my life and got me to stop the cycle of fat camp because I came home, I hopped on the scale and I saw what the weight was, which I think was like 185 pounds from 215. And I saw it was 185. And I'm like, okay, all the previous years, I weigh out of camp and I don't see a scale for another 10 months. That doesn't work. That just keeps making me gain 60 over the next 10 months. This year, I remember I called my mom and I said, please put a scale in my closet. She got a $15, $20 scale, Walmart, Target, whatever it is, put it in my closet. And I promised myself that I would go on it at least twice a week throughout the school year to make sure it always stays at 185. It doesn't go past the 180s. I don't do it again. And that was the biggest saving grace because, you know, freshman year of high school, I maintained my weight, my weight loss for the first time in my entire life. And the summer after freshman year, I was able to do this amazing summer program with my friends and not have to go back to weight loss camp. So, you know, this is really a fun interview. I don't think I've ever expressed this much. People always wonder why I'm so positive about weight loss, so positive about the scale. Yeah. A lot of it comes from this, you know, deep upbringing. Well, it's unbelievable because it's almost like this is something that you were meant to do and meant to be because you were so positive about it when everyone else was kicking and screaming. 
and you have a testicular fortitude to, to realize that this scale is going to, and, and you, you, you thought to yourself, I'm going to take advantage of this. Yes, it may be a fun summer camp and I am the OG and I'm popular, but I'm going to really listen. And I'm really impressed with that. Now, did you top out at 215? Yeah, that was the highest weight I saw on the scale. Okay. And then, so you maintained the 180s and how tall were you at this point? I was 5'2 okay. at 215 um, at 13. And then I started maintaining it through high school and starting to lose it. And over high school, I got another about inch and a half. And then I think I got my last half inch. I'm 5'4 now, actually like freshman, sophomore year of college. I always like to tell girls like who are like, I'm done growing at 17. I'm like, I really do think I got a nice like boost yeah. by around 18. <laughs> Definitely. That is so fascinating. Now, did you ever... Um, gain the freshman 15 or were you already so focused on your scale in the closet and everything you learned that you didn't gain that? Yeah, I'm, this is why, you know, to this day, I love working with teenagers. I have several teenage clients. It's why I have like 1.4 million followers on TikTok. I'm obsessed with speaking to teenagers because that's how old I was when I was really struggling. And I love telling, you know, these teenagers while they're, you know, heavier than all their friends and feel like they have to make choices and their friends don't, I always say you deal with it now. You don't have to deal with it later. If you just sort it out, you know, at this young age, it's a life skill. It's a life skill to know how to eat, to control your weight in a really healthy way. And if you deal with it younger, you just don't have to deal with it after the freshman 15, after your first baby and in, in after menopause and so forth. So I uh, went into college with the same sentiment. I started losing like loads of, like really actually just a healthy, steady amount of weight through high school, going from 185 to about 155 uh, all through high school. So I lost about 30 pounds over the four years, like super healthy, steady, like just loved it. The scale of my room and bringing in all the principles I now talk about within my book and my program and so forth. And uh, then after, then for freshman year of college, I um, actually, after the summer going in, I decided to go back as a counselor. And I actually, I loved being a counselor and the kids loved having me because I was like, I was proof of concept. Oh, and yeah. I was, right. And I, I literally was in the same bunk that changed my life. The girls going into high school, they still stay in touch with me today. I loved it. I loved it. But I actually got made fun of that year for being a little self-centered and like, where's Alana? She's not with her kids. She's running on the track because I was like, again, in that mindset of, I got to take advantage and now it's free. I'm actually getting paid to be here. <laughs> like, But you wanted to go back. 15. That's how positive it was for you. Other, Can you imagine anybody else that you that you went to camp with wanting to go back and you gave back to that? Now, yeah. Because- and I also used it for selfish purposes because I also wanted to go from like, maybe 160 to 145 that summer, which was also a really big, you know, move for me. And then I went into freshman year of college, drinking, partying, sororitying, that whole thing. But I did have a scale of me and I did have all my principles and I made all my healthy swaps and had a good mindset about it the whole way. That's unbelievable. Now, um, I'm very interested in how you were as a counselor and comparing that to the counselors that you had growing up. Because number one, you, you did state that they didn't really teach you a whole lot because they wanted to perpetuate the motion of the business to keep coming mm-hmm. back. Now, did you change a lot of those principles? And also, did they teach you? Like, I'm just trying to think in the cafeteria, would they break down, would they have nutrition classes? And <laughs> was everything sort of like, did, did they incorporate resistance training or anything like that? Were you taught the principles or is this something you did yourself? All right. Yeah. I, I totally forgot to answer that, that great question you had, like what the day to day was like and what they ate and, and exercise. Okay. This is the most fun interview. I'm so, I love to do this. I mean, this is my whole childhood and it was great. Okay. So basically you'd wake up. Should I go through a day? Yes, please. So, thanks for sharing. Okay. This is fascinating. Of course. It's so fun. <laughs> so you'd, you'd wake up and um, you'd line up for breakfast and you'd get like the morning announcements and you know, depending on how well you stood in line or whatever it was, your bunk got to go down to eat. And it was always like the most exciting thing ever when you got to go uh, earlier, you were called early because it wasn't like a, another camp, I guess, that just has like the food on the table waiting for people, family style. This is like, you have to line up because every single tray gets pre-portioned. So if you were last to be called, you would literally be waiting for your meal outside for like 45 minutes, just like 
talking to friends and whatever. So, um, so you'd line up, there was always a nutritionist, a registered dietitian who stood at the stand in case there was any like allergy or specification. Like she always just like monitored everything, um, and helped make swaps. Right. So like if someone was dairy free and it was mac and cheese, like she would be there to make sure like, okay, the mac and cheese can get swapped for a baked potato back there or so forth. Um, but you waited in line, you got your tray of a pre-portioned food, which became a little controversial because the older 17 year old boys were getting very similar trays to the eight year old girls. Um, you know, just because like how much, you know, they have to automate it to some degree. And then, you know, they started doing like double protein for the older boys and so forth. But like to some degree, you know, everyone had like the same meal plan and you'd get your tray and you'd go sit down. And the only thing that was on the tables was water pitchers, right? Because you could have unlimited water. And then the, um, a, a few years into being at camp as a camper, the one thing I was always trying to manipulate is how I could like make the most of it, right? How do I get more? And I, I think I just always have that mentality. My dad is very much like that. Like, how could I get a deal or whatever? <laughs> and um, there was a point where I learned, like, you can actually go back for more salad. Like, if you were still hungry and there was salad with, like, you know, Italian dressing or whatever it is, you could go back for more veggies. And that is, that became my thing. Like my friends didn't make that their thing. That became my thing. Um, and I would always go back for double broccoli, double salad, double this, because I'm a volume eater. And that was one of those things when I got home, it's like, I brought back the scale because that was something we had to camp. I brought back the unlimited water. And then I brought back the fact that I had unlimited veggies. I lost the same weight, if not more weight than all my friends. And I was the one who was diligent about, I'm going to get that double portion veggie because I'm entitled to it. I deserve it. I'm going to, I'm going to yes, take it. And then you didn't go hungry, but you filled yourself on volumetrics, which were high fiber, great things for your body. So Absolutely. no more jars of peanut bad. butter that had the okay, but yeah, exactly. 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 And that's the, those are the type of things that I brought in to help me maintain throughout the school year. Um, but then let's get to the workouts. Okay. So after you finished your meal, the, the cliche thing about the camp that they do not talk enough about uh, on reality television, I think they must have mentioned it is the dining hall was at the bottom of what we called the hill of death. It's crazy, but in order to go get your food, it was the most vertical mountain on the planet. And you, you literally, your rolls would just like, like tumbling, like, ah, uh, as you <laughs> rend on the mountain. And then to walk up after breakfast, after lunch, after dinner was an actual hike, like an actual hike. Like if you live in Los Angeles, and you know, Runyon Canyon, like that's basically what you had to do after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You it's had to that walk high. Up it's so deep to the point that like your first week in camp, you're so not used to it. You're so like out of shape coming out of wherever and going there. It's literally heck. Um, the, there would sometimes be golf carts going up like maintenance staff or something. People would like hold on to the back of the golf cart and try to run with it. Um, it was insane. I mean, and there was always like time to walk it because after breakfast was like morning cleanup after lunch was a little rest and after dinner was shower hour. So like you had time to like get up that hill and it was nuts. The hill was so crazy steep. Like to this day, if I did it, I would probably feel out of shape. That's like, a lot of mind games right there for, for adolescents because you run down and then it's like, you don't even really want to go back up, but you have to. And <laughs> Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, yeah. And then, and then you work out constantly. So then you have like five activities a day, um, two in the morning between, or three in the morning between breakfast and lunch, two or three in the morning between breakfast and lunch, and then three between lunch and dinner. Um, and the activities are like 85 to 90% soccer, basketball, aerobics, Taibo, which was like a huge room with Billy Blanks, uh, like, you know, forecasted, sure. um, on videos, uh, aerobics. There were some great step aerobics instructors that I loved. Um, and then like dance class, uh, volleyball track slash weight training. Like you could go in to do weights or you could just walk the track. Swimming was very big swimming instructional swim that actually made me a really good swimmer. And I loved it. Uh, tennis, incredible facilities like baseball, really amazing. So 85% of the activities were that. And then there's 15% activities every day. You had like one arts and crafts or ropes course, or, um, you know, 
that like art, basically like arts and crafts or a rap session, which was a, with a therapist and talked about therapy. That was great. That was mandated three times a week. You had like this therapy session where you could do a mix of talking about the issues in your bunk um, and the bullying at school. So that was really incredible. And then you always had nutrition courses. So everyone, you did really have nutrition classes. So there was mandated like two to three times a week therapy, these therapy classes we called wrap sessions. And then also two to three nutrition sessions a week with a dietitian. And that is why I always say I have more education than any other dietitian, because I've literally been having three times a week nutrition classes with a dietitian since I'm eight years old every summer for two months or like eight years prior to even going into all the schooling I've had. Um, That's unbelievable. Now for the activities, were you able to choose what you wanted? And were some kids just like kicking and screaming because I, going back to that MTV camp, Shane, you could see that some of them were just crying, did not want to run. I mean, right. some of these children obviously are so overweight and it's bad for their knees. And did they keep track of like heat stroke and all these things that can happen when a child is even more overweight? Did they watch that? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of water stations. Also, we were in the Catskills where it's not, I mean, it so was hot. hot, but like you're in the mountains, it wasn't blistering painful. Again, it's really interesting because I went as as young as eight. So for me, it was like, okay, this is what we do versus imagine like those kids, I can't even like who are going to other camps or who were just eating fast food with their friends by the pool all summer. And then they had to go for their first time at 13. It would be like the craziest shock to your system. Especially and those are the 13, people who, which is right. The worst and age. those are the yeah, especially if that was your first year. And then those are the people who like tried to always sneak out and stuff like that. And take the Advil with the sugar. That's fascinating too. Well, those are the people who certainly gain all their weight back, you know? Yeah, Because they just come into kicking and screaming and not see it as like an amazing opportunity versus when I talk about my years at Fat Camp now, people are like, that is fabulous. Like sign me up. Like how yes. can I go and just have my food measured and, and my trainers, you know, position. Well, it was your positive attitude and forward thinking and you're highly intelligent, obviously, and wanted to get a deal with the volumetrics. I totally agree with that. Um, now for the nutrition classes, I'm sorry to get so deep into it. I'm just so interested. I love it. Um, how, obviously this is before the time of like the popularity of keto and everything like that. Did they just teach kind of sustainability, like basic fruits and vegetables? Was there kind of like a don't do dairy, but that was probably too forward thinking at that time. Unfortunately, I had so much education on the outdated, highly damageable food guide pyramid that suggested eight to 11 grains a day. So it was bad. I mean, that's what we were teaching. And like, I don't blame, you know, the dietitians of the time because I mean, we're talking like what early 90s. And it was like government. 90s. They wanted to get the wheat fields and grain fields. I mean, there's, as we know, it's a lot. Totally. It was, you know, highly subsidized by the grain council. And so, you know, if they were doing the eight servings of bread a day for us, because they gave us like two whole grain waffles for breakfast and maybe some, you know, whole grain pasta at lunch, you know, and, you know, a small square of, of pizza or something for dinner, along with the salads and whatever, you know, it made sense because we were working out constantly and growing kids. But when I would try to imp implement that or even think about implementing that going home, it really wouldn't work. So really only was honestly in the, not from the classroom setting, but really in the practical setting of, of seeing that I could get unlimited vegetables, but nothing else that I was able to take that, um, you know, to the camp's credit, they did do uh, two cooking classes uh, summer. So I remember we made like a really yummy breakfast burrito that I continued to make at home. Like I showed my parents, hey, you scramble eggs, you cut, you cut like maybe a quarter of an avocado, you cut up tomatoes, you add some sprinkle of cheese, you put in a, a whole wheat tortilla and you can make a breakfast burrito. And I remember being like, that's delicious and that's easy. And, you know, we made things like that, which was always fun. I mean, it was definitely a, an amazing experience. That's so great. Now, did you, did they talk about portion control? And, and obviously you talked about the fact that the teenage boys were not created equal as the eight-year-olds. Um, were you taught to kind of know how much like, like a, like a fist would be for the meat, things like that? 
Totally, totally. Okay. Um, yeah, they absolutely did their part in teaching these things and like how to use your hands. So it's like the top of your thumb is a teaspoon and your whole thumb is a tablespoon. But, you know, the problem is, is it's not just the camp's fault. Like I went home to no supervision. Like I went home to, again, eating with the peanut butter and a spoon alone in the jar, uh, like with the jar yeah. alone in the kitchen. So you know, it's definitely not the camp's fault. It's just treating the camp like a band-aid and not spending the whole school year, you know, it wasn't like the two months I was there, my parents were working on a system of how they were going to. Exactly. Like Al-Anon or something like that for alcoholics where the whole right. family gets involved. Um, if you were to do things. And they, and they did their, they did their part, like they would have supported me in any way, but I was also a sneaky eater. Like it wasn't even, you know, I wasn't even that the house that was like Willy Wonka. Like I have, you know, I know people who keep loads of candy in my house. I was the youngest and my parents couldn't keep that stuff in the house. Also, it wasn't like you opened our pantry and it was just like Twizzlers, but it was things like, so my dad's business was in the house. So then for around the holidays, people would send him like a whole tray of chocolates, let's say, like a whole thing of Godiva as like a, a business gift. And I would eat the whole tray, right? And for a yearbook, we would sell Oreos and I would basically eat my supply. So um, it was things like that. I, you know, it wasn't like my family was like trying to sabotage the donut eating and things like that. It was like, I'm a volume eater. I found a way to get food. I used to walk to school by myself because I grew up in New York City and I would stop at the corner store on 72nd and Broadway and get a Snickers ice cream bar for breakfast every day walking to school. And this was in blizzard temperatures. Like I remember wearing like gloves and this big puffy coat and I would eat an ice cream bar in my school and I can still almost taste it with my mouth. I'm like sure I, you can. Was that, <laughs> was that on the way home from school? You would do that every day? That was on the way to school. And on my way home from school, I did loads of things. Like on Fridays, we sold bread rolls. Um, like, because I, it was a Jewish school and we sold challah rolls sure. and they come six in a bag. Uh, and it's meant for the entire family for like several days. And we sold this brand bagel city challah rolls that were like dough and, and they were the size of your face. And I would eat a solid four on the way home from school, like, like huge. And how like, bread is so full of butter, isn't it? It's full. It's sugar and yeah. oil. It's, it, sugar well, it's delicious oil. bread. I absolutely love hollow bread. Oh, that's so interesting. But on the way to, you would have this frozen Snickers. So that was basically yeah. your breakfast. Yeah. Um, but and all that's mindless, right? That's like on my walk. That's not even like what I would sit down to eat. Well, and then when you're walking in New York City, it's a free for all. I mean, you can get cheesecake, you can get, you can get pizza, everything Everywhere. like that. Um, wow, that's that's fascinating. And I just want to go back to really quickly um, the counseling sessions. Do you think? Because I I heard another dietitian talk, and she was an actual actual counselor at Camp Shane, and oh. she said that. And you know, she didn't mention Camp Shane. She said an East Coast popular one, which I'm sure is probably yeah. the one. And um, she said she was not equipped at all for the problems that she was encountered with, with the teenage girls, as far as like suicidal thoughts, depression, um, self-hatred. Did you see a lot of that in, in your friends or because you were such a positive, like intelligent, right. fun girl, I don't, maybe you didn't see that as much, Totally. but when you were a counselor, um, did you, and were you, did you feel equipped to do that? Right. Oh, I bet that that she saw those things thinking in hindsight, for sure. Um, you know, I definitely, I definitely had like a pretty, I mean, and I don't want to say shelter because my like, I mean, my parents, I, I mean, like there was a lot I was exposed to as a kid, like, especially living on 72nd street, right? Sure. Like, I know it well. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> I'm definitely not sheltered, but I do have this like air of optimism. And I really always, I think, try to connect with the more like innocent slash um, positive people. So there was definitely, definitely that crowd. Um, especially, you know, I remember the stage of like Avril Lavigne and really emo dressing and things like that. You know, you definitely had those kids who appeared and would speak to their troubles a little bit more, be quiet in, you know, the sessions with their head down a lot. Um, but I'm sure privately they really needed those rap sessions a lot. Um, and we did like 
cute collages, like going through magazines, talking about body culture and the models and, and what their bodies, how they make us feel. Like they definitely did, you know, intensive workshops with us to help build our self-esteem and manage the social pressures. Were they the child world. psychiatrists or was it psychologists? You know what? I don't know. I, I know that all the nutritionists were definitely registered dietitians or in school to be like yeah. on their road to becoming one, um, like within a year or so. Uh, but with the therapist, it was actually the dietitians were always young, right? They were always like 22, 23, maybe like right out of school, but definitely had the schooling they needed to sure. take the job versus the therapists uh, for those sessions were older. They were definitely like in their forties and fifties. I'm sure that they were. I respect that because that's, that's a lot. And did you see any disorders? Like, did you see any bulimia or borderline? Did some people go so crazy that they almost got anorexic? Did you see any of these crazy ups and downs or was it pretty much steady across the board? Yeah, there was something interesting about when I was there that I don't think goes on anymore. Um, Cause remember like over the past 20 years, uh, since I went to now, or, you know, 25 years, whatever it is, the obesity epidemic has gone like way up, way, way, way up. So when I was there by, I was by no means thin, right. I was five, two, and then I was 215 pounds. I wasn't the thinnest. I wasn't the heaviest, but when I was there, there was actually a clique of girls in almost every age range that were cheerleaders that were cheerleaders and they needed to lose like 10 pounds for cheerleading camp. And the funny thing is, is like, I actually became like best friends with them. I, I loved those super, super, you know, thin girls and, and they were, you know, plenty fine. And they would like squeeze their little thighs and be like, oh my gosh, I have this, but they laid like ruled camp, right? Because they were like, they just got told they were skinny all day. And, you know, I, during the school year, they always feel like they're bigger than everyone else on the team. So that was something that we always had at camp. And I remember those girls, like, definitely took it like really seriously. And those are also some of the girls that like snuck in alcohol or got, got the older guys too. And things like that. There was like definitely that culture. Yeah. And I was close to them. Um, but they were teeny, like they were teeny, teeny, tiny little girls. Then I remember going back just to visit. Like, I think I just went back on a day, maybe Camp Shane um, asked me to be a speaker because I do like, I, I do, and, and they've come a long way and I do respect the camp so much. And I remember I went to go visit um, in my like mid twenties or something like far past being there as a camper or counselor. And I remember looking around and being like, I don't remember kids this big. And I think that's with the obesity epidemic that just, you know, the range of weight when I was there at eight just was so different than the range when I was there, you know, at 28. And um, I think that's with like just the rising obesity epidemic. I do think they also got some, some insurance reimbursement. So I think when I, I remember when I went older, I remember it being much more diverse. I remember it being much heavier. And I remember like, there was no patch of like, thin girls with complexes. Like it was everyone needed, needed to be there the way I did. Do you feel like the kids were also taller? Do you feel like there, there were just a little bit more bigger? bigger. They were huge. Yeah. I I really felt like everyone was really big, like just tall and broad, um, and definitely like heavier. And also I was also going when I was thinner. So maybe it was just that. And you were only, and you're only five, four and very, and then you were lean. So you just felt like it was probably just such a juxtaposition. Yeah. I remember thinking like when I went later, like this is not the camp I remember. Oh, that is fascinating. Um, I I think that would must be hard as, as far as I I love that you became friends with the cheerleaders, but I can imagine there had to be a lot of animosity with the other children at the camp. I mean, I didn't, I never, thank God, I think the most disgusting, unflattering trait of anyone is jealousy. Like I'd rather someone be, you know, nasty or rude than be jealous. Like I just think, I think jealousy is like the worst trait ever. So I, and that honestly, I really built my weight loss program around not being jealous, around finding healthy, fit people. And rather than being jealous and upset, just actually studying them to see what works. That's so such a key to success. And what a great message when you're counseling teenage girls, like on TikTok and things like that, because yeah. people are really nasty. And I, oh, I yeah. can't imagine how wonderfully approachable you are to these teens, because 
I mean, looking at you now, it's like, it's hard to believe kind of like, oh, you're making this up, Alana, but you're, because you're so beautiful and put together, but you get to show them what you were not, not to say that that wasn't right. beautiful. Um, so they can really see tangibly and you were on the, on the brochure of before and after. Totally. So it's so tangible to them. And the fact that you are coming at them and such a beautifully positive message. And I think that you're being the third born, the, you're the youngest of three in a very torrential divorce family. And I think you mentioning on that other podcast where I listened to you was that your family was very, very loving. There was never, mm -hmm. oh, you're, they were never ripping on you for being overweight. And were your siblings overweight or was it just, just you? We were, we were all overweight. Um, and everyone kind of figured it out to some degree over the years, a lot with my program, thankfully, like I, my program finally gave my father's down 60 pounds and has kept it off for years. He was one of my first clients Wonderful. when I started doing it professionally. Um, I did have a family member who bullied me horribly, horribly, horribly. Um, and I continue to distance myself from this person to this day. Um, I had a couple family members who did bully me, not my mom or my dad, um, or my sister who I'm super close with, but you know, my, I had a great aunt who, you know, was deaf and she didn't realize how much, how loud she was screaming at family functions when she'd be like, you're so fat. Um, so, you know, but, and then I had like a, a closer family member who literally would just tor torment me, um, like in my ear around food, be like, it's just food, Alana. It's just food. Oh, like God. really, really toxic and, and yeah. horrible. Were they um, Israeli or were they from, were they American? No, we were um, Eastern European yeah. Holocaust survivor children. So oh, there's wow. definitely that, the whole like no wasting food and, and yes, so forth. Absolutely. Scarcity. But a lot of times the Eastern Europeans, because I'm actually also Eastern European, that is a tough culture. And I, I've, I've heard the same thing where it's like five minutes on the lips, 10 years on the hips. And it was always okay. constantly driven into you. And we're Russian Orthodox, so it's all very strict and disciplined. So um, I understand you on that. But I, but you yeah, and I deal with people of all those different backgrounds. It's oh, so interesting to, yeah. so interesting, honestly. I know this sounds weird, but I've had like hundreds and hundreds of clients at this point. And I have the people who say that they had family like that, who always made way to thing and always like, you know, emphasized it to the point of obsession where like it was bad. And then I also have a lot of clients whose parents were very overweight, gave them whatever they wanted and never did anything about their weight. And I have to say, it's such a horrible thing to say because they're both so bad. And I really hope to like remove all those evils in the next generation. Um, but the truth is, is I feel like the families that emphasized health to too far of a degree, those people, while they talk about their upbringings as like toxic, I do see that those are still the people I'm working with today that need 20 to 40 pounds to lose, 50 pounds to lose. But the clients I have whose parents completely ate non-healthily, never made weight a thing to have, or sometimes my clients have 150 pounds to lose and like so many habits to make up. So, so it does neither, kind of have a positive spin. Neither are good. Neither yeah. are good. And I want to make that really clear, but I do like to remove like the hate or like vengefulness the people from the like very thin focused families have. I like to like, just make them feel a little bit better and knowing like it wasn't, the message wasn't executed well for you, but the underlying importance of health and weight probably did you a greater service than not because, you know, a lot of people like to see you can be healthy at every size, but the bottom line is heart disease is the number one killer for all men and all women in the United States. And it kills heart disease, kills more Americans than all cancers combined. And it's combined. Month. February is heart health month. Yes. February is heart month. And if you go to the American heart association, which is, has collected hundreds of like millions of dollars of research on heart disease, 80% is preventable of um, the top five things that can make it preventable weight control is 20% of the puzzle. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be overly emphasized to a toxic point, a hundred percent not, but it does have to be something that we continue to emphasize and in a positive way. And that's why I feel a tremendous responsibility to do so because I've been there. So I get it. 
Um, but we can't have a society that's also saying, be any size, eat whatever you want, sure. because it's legitimately killing us in front of our eyes at the same time. And I did notice that you actually do take responsibility because you are on the executive leadership team for American Heart Association yeah. and you lead the Bruin Health Improvement Program at UCLA. So that is... I did that for many years. That's wonderful. That's very impressive. And I continue to be on the executive leadership form for the Heart American Heart Association Go Red for Women campaign in LA because it, there aren't so many people who feel like they can liberally talk about weight loss because you have such like an anti-diet culture movement and I get it. But just because we're shaming diets doesn't mean we have to shame the whole culture around weight loss because our obesity numbers are insane. And the heart um, doesn't even show sometimes you could just drop dead without some warning signs sometimes. So yeah. Oh my gosh. Especially for women, they say women just completely and totally ignore it. Uh, studies are fascinating that like women are like less likely to call 911 when having a heart attack, right? We're quicker to be like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yep. Take Everything care of everybody okay. else. Exactly. Yep. Now, um, and I'll, I'll, before we wrap this up, you talk about the principles that you mean that you discovered the principles for yourself. Number one being the scale, number two being volumetrics, like more salad, more broccoli. And by the way, was mm -hmm. that just an unlimited salad bar when you talk about that? No, no, no. Oh, you no, would no. ask for more? You would have to go, oh, you would have to go God. back up to the counter. Um, and well, that's and annoying. Wait for the line to the side. Yeah. Okay. I, I just feel like the salad bar should have been open. One other thing that was actually unlimited that I always forget to mention is when we had cereal, you got like the pre, you know, measured like plastic containers of, of cereal, like yeah. raisin bran or whatever it was, but the plastic on top. And they would put huge jugs of skim milk on the tables. And I would drink it like water on those days. I mean, just because I could. Sure. <laughs> well, it's delicious. Skim milk is really good, but yeah. that also is like, what is it? hundred or 60 calories per cup. So that would have yeah, 80 calories a cup and super cold and nourishing. And again, yes. like we were growing kids. So it, that was probably also the methodology. Right. But would you have done that differently if you were to run the camp? No, you know, That's there's okay. also like a matter of convenience. How are you going to like yeah, you know, put the liquid on people's trays and have them walk back. So. True, true. That's interesting. But you talk you talk about the principles that you were established pretty early: the scale, the volumetrics. Anything yeah, I, else? I have my yes. I call them my two bunnies. They're my four principles that work all the time. My core four: water first, veggies most. So load load up on water first. Eat veggies most. Use the scale um, in a positive way. Uh, because most of the time when people use the scale on my program, they see that it's on the days that they eat more, they actually weigh less. Um, so use the scale and write down everything you eat. So you don't have to count calories. You don't have to count macros. You don't have to tally it up and, and you know, add, multiply, subtract, or any of those things. But if you bite it, you write it. If you drink it, you ink it. If you nibble it, you scribble it. So if you have two slices of pizza, you just write it down. If you have, you know, a uh, handful of pretzels, write it down. If you forgot to count, you know, how many numbers it was, that's not the point as much as it is creating the mindfulness around it. Uh, and together, those four principles have literally saved, like, and I have led to people losing over a million. I love that. So it's the core four, drink more, veggies most, um, get, get a scale and then write everything down, bite it, write it, drink it, ink it. Yeah. That's so cool. And it's the core four. I love that. That's just like easy to remember for kids. And also they're not, like you said, not counting macros going back with fire mm -hmm. track subtraction. Um, but however, I think you mentioned on that other podcast that I listened to that it's people lie to themselves. So they only write down certain things, but it's like, well, then why are you keep gaining? Oh, well, actually uh, I did go to Starbucks yeah. and got a Frappuccino and da, 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 da. Um, totally. yeah. And I, and I did read an article that you had published about um, the, the top six that you avoid. And number one on your, one of the ones on your list was the Frappuccino at Starbucks, which is absolutely delicious. But as we know, that's I a whopper. I had so many Frappuccinos when I was 215 pounds. I can't even tell you. Sure. I got like $20 as my allowance and I just would blow it on those venti Frappuccinos with cream. I mean, it's such a glorified, like thousand calorie dessert. It's crazy. Um, and it's disguised as coffee, which is there even like any coffee in it? It's crazy. Especially not the caramel frappuccino. It's just, oh, but they're God. really I saw someone, good. <laughs> I know. 
it's 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 kind of wild those starbucks drinks really and it's wild because they're like seven dollars each it's like so crazy uh how many people have them but yeah the milkshakes and the frappuccinos and that stuff gosh and i mean it's like the daiquiris and the pina coladas i mean talk about sipping calories that's like sipping days worth of calories absolutely no um just what is your daily regimen as far as like fitness and how do you eat oh great question um I always find my weight and my mind and my whole body is the absolute best when I'm doing yoga. My body is designed for yoga. Um, Yoga is the best thing in the world. It makes me a better mom. It makes me a better everything. Um, I love hot yoga that's been shut down through the pandemic. So I spent several months in the pandemic getting into you know, workout videos and fitness videos and, and, you know, weight training, things like that. But honestly, I just discovered a yoga online series that I'm loving. And I feel like I just instantly lost five pounds, feel better, feel longer, feel leaner. I am designed for yoga. The high intensity stuff is great for people who love it. For me, it just raises my appetite, gets me just crazy injured. I've had so many injuries. Um, and it doesn't really relieve my stress or make me like a more mindful eater. You know, it doesn't make me healthier overall. Like I just think my body is designed for power vinyasa flow and I do power. Like I definitely do, you know, to the point where I'm sweating and I'm going fast and I'm in a flow and I'm doing lots of push-ups and, and, you know, core work, but the jumping stuff, not for me, like at all. Well, and that's interesting too, because so many if you're counseling teenage girls or teenagers in general, a lot of them don't really want to do hard physical activity like CrossFit and things like that. So the fact that you're even talking about that, the vinyasa yoga plus using the core and you mentioned push-ups, you're also resistance training. Yeah, it's all all within like the yoga framework, but like I don't approachable. Yeah, I don't believe you have to train like super hard to lose weight. And for me, it's actually the opposite. Like the more intense I train, the more I eat, the more I gain. Again, more that's approachability just, there. That's, yeah. that's pretty, otherwise if you're shoving down their throats, you have to do hundred pushups and all these other things. That's, that's really mm-hmm. great. Now, um, just to, to, um, and are you more tough love with your, with your clients? Yes, you are. I am way tougher, uh, one-on-one than people realize. Um, especially because in the first session, I really get people's backgrounds, like in depth, the way you just got mine. And I will use things against people like when they don't want it. Um, you know, people will be like, you know, I'll have a client who I know has it in her to, you know, work herself harder and focus on it, but she's got lost with like, you know, parenting or so forth. And, you know, she'll, she'll kind of use me because I'm not restrictive. So sometimes a client will be like, you know, I had a lot of treats this weekend, but I, I don't feel guilty about it. I don't feel guilty about it. Cause like, they think that that's the thing I'm going to emphasize, which sure, like I'm always going to make someone never feel guilty about anything, but I'll be like, okay, you're, you're telling me you don't feel guilty. That's great. But like, let me just remind you about your goals and like what you could have done in that situation and what we're going to do in the next situation. Like we're not going to, you know, so I'm very tough. Um, if a client's coming to see me for weight loss, I'm not satisfied unless their pounds are dropping. So even if they're saying like, I have a healthy relationship with food and I did well, but like they're staying the same or maybe went up half a pound or something like I'm still not happy. Like I'm still going to want to dissect it and figure out what they have to do to lose the weight and what they know they have to do because I, as much as I like love mindful eating and improving a person's relationship with food, I also believe that only comes with uh, attaining and reaching the weight and health state that you desire from an objective standpoint, because if you desire to be, let's say a size eight and you're a size 10, and you're saying you have a healthy relationship with food, you're still going to cringe or feel negative about your body every time you're putting on you know, the 12 or or whatever it is. And by the way, all those are healthy sizes. I've been every size from zero to 20. Um, But just, just saying like, I am very goal and results oriented in the healthiest possible, most fulfilling way. Uh, But yes, I, I don't, I don't waste people, people's times. Um, And so I'm pretty tough about. And they keep coming back to you, which is great. Um, Now, and what are you, what are your goals? And I, before, before we let you go also, I want to make sure that you are Alana Molstein on Twitter and Facebook and on Instagram is Alana Molstein RD. YouTube is Alana Proud Poser, correct? 
Oh, it, it's Alana Molstein. I know it still comes up as that sometimes, but it should be Alana Molstein. Okay. And then on TikTok, I'm Nutrition Babe. Nutrition Babe. Oh, I love that. Okay, great. Um, would you can get the, some of the teenage boys too? I'm, I'm, I'm I can imagine. Um, <laughs> it's still mostly female, but yeah. <laughs> that's so great. And then um, your goals for yourself and your career. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so myself, I'm like, I obviously want to raise my children in a super healthy sound environment. My number one goal my whole life is just uh, my marriage, like, you know, breeding my marriage to be the healthiest it possibly could be. Um, so definitely my marriage is my number one goal. Happily married to my husband, like, and constantly working on our marriage to improve it in the best way we can. Um, same thing as a parent um, and raising my kids in a healthy environment for myself. Definitely yoga for life is a promise I made to my late mother that I will always do yoga for life. Um, so those are like personal and then when it comes to professional, so I get, you know, thousands of direct messages constantly of people who want to work with me privately because they have an allergy or an IBS or something on top of what they can get from my book or my program. Um, and they have some sort of like specialty or just deeper negative relationship with food or so things. So I have, you know, thousands of people who want to work with me one-on-one -on -one in my private practice and my rate is high just because my time is limited. And uh, there are a lot of people who can't afford my current rate. And I realize it's unfortunate because there should just be so many other dietitians who are well-trained, who can help take my spot and also be able to give people the medical nutrition therapy they need in the best, you know, most respectful evidence-based practice that they can. So I actually created a program called the successful nutritionist, where I'm training registered dietitians and nutritionists on how to be more profitable and effective. And the same thing goes with how I want my clients to lose weight, you know, and improve the relationship with food, how I train my dietitians and nutritionists, like, sure, I want them to help more people, but if they're not making more money, they're not going to have the incentive, the drive, the resources to help more people. So I created this course called the successful nutritionist that thankfully like dozens of dietitians and nutritionists have been doing and seeing amazing success in their businesses. So they're able to make more money, support their family better, support themselves and their own dreams better while helping more people. Because that is like, like, you know, you got my whole story of my initial struggle and how I overcame that, but being able to do this full time and support myself in such a big way while helping thousands and thousands, if not over a million, two million people now is only a result of also making sure I had my eye on the numbers and that I was profitable and organized and strategic every step of the way. So now I'm trying to give those tools to more dietitians and nutritionists so they could do the same. You are your father's daughter. He's got to be damn proud of you. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. What a way to parlay that. That's, that's just huge and successful and it's very, very motivating. And thank you for sharing all these wonderful goals and, and for helping so many people because you're never going to be out of work because look at this epidemic, as we know, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, uh, are we even getting the proper nutrition? I mean, I feel like, or just the proper messages because in the pandemic, we all see that the, the obese are get hit the worst, but yet we're not really hearing and it. Yeah, but it's also our responsibility. Uh, it's, it's so hard because there's like two ends of toxic information. You have the side of people saying, eat whatever you want, be whatever size you want, which is toxic. And then you also have these toxic, like toxic, toxic, toxic influencers one comes straight to mind in the moment because um of a recent thing they uh advertised that was horrible um uh, of, of you have this side of people who are saying everything is chemicals and everything is toxic and and you know all restaurants are bad and all fast food is bad and all products are bad and it's just it's like you're just shaming people and making them feel bad, which is actually proven to backfire, proven to backfire. Um, so, you know, there's such a crazy need uh, for this in between, like speaking about weight loss in a way that's simple, sensible and sustainable, which is why I get up every morning and work as hard as I do. And also why I encourage more dietitians and nutritionists to take my course on understanding how to balance these extremes and 
be the most effective at health communication because that's actually what my master's is in. It's in nutrition with a focus on health communication, entrepreneurship, um, and public so health type of thing. Yeah, because it's it's tough. It's it's a uh, it's communicating um, in a way that's attractive and gets goes viral, but is also the right message is a dance and in 15 seconds. And that being Nutrition Babe on TikTok. TikTok, yeah. Alana, would you please give some final thoughts on your opinion of Camp Shane and if you would choose to send any clients there and how you would proceed and what you would maybe recommend for proactive, reactive behaviors in the household? Camp Shane, I speak very fondly of, and I just think, you know, when I have counseled, a lot of parents have asked me about sending their kids to Camp Shane, and I always recommend they do. I just recommend they go in with a plan of how they're going to execute the coming home. How do you talk to the kid about making it the most positive experience, taking advantage of it best and so forth. But I've been asked by so many people what I recommend uh, Camp Shane for their kids, and I constantly say yes. Um, as long as I know the kid and I know the situation, I. You know, COVID actually stopped one one family from sending their kid, and I was really sad about it because I think he would have just totally thrived in that environment. Wow, but as long as they have the core four, as you talk about, I think that's fantastic. It, it's good for adults too. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you for having me. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. This is one of my favorite interviews. Thank you. And that was Alana Molstein. You can find all of her social media links below and also please check her out on TikTok as Nutrition Babe. We appreciate you for listening and please subscribe and rate the show on iTunes. You can also listen on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Luminary, Tuned In, or at Believe.com. You can reach out to me for any questions or topics that you'd like covered on the show at Ann McDaniels. And I'll see you next time on So 